Paul, what's up, man? Not much. Just got back from up north uh, snowmobiling cool. with my daughter. Do you have? I know you used to race uh, motorcycles and stuff. Do you have? Do you do you have like a souped up uh, uh, snowmobile, snowmobile or just regular? I used to. Uh, <laughs> I figured. <laughs> yeah, about ten years ago, I did some drag racing with the snow machines. Those were fun. That was fun on tar and and ice and snow and grass. But no, uh, now we just run just trail machines. With me and my daughter, we were up there in Marquette, and we rode a couple hundred miles. Wow. Beautiful. Wow. Oh, yeah, that's cool. So the uh, – the uh, let's just jump right in, man. Let's get into ELR. I had I had Chase uh, uh, a couple of days ago on, the, on here, and he kind of yeah. – we touched on it a little bit, and uh, I just never have thought about what it takes to – make a shot that long you know what i mean because for 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 me oh i'm gonna you know make a 600 700 1200 yard shot you take out your range finder you range it and then you dial your deal and you're you know you're there but for you guys sure. it's drastically different it is yeah i mean that's kind of what you know attracted me to the sport you know we were i was shooting f class with a 308 at a thousand and uh Awesome experience, uh, great memories with Team USA and Team Sinclair. Um, you know, 20 years of, of shooting 308. And then I got into the ELR, you know, back in 15, 16. And, you know, I looked at, I didn't know anything about a Kestrel or, you know, because we use lab radars with the U.S. rifle team. But we didn't, you know, we had known distances, right? 600 right. and 1,000 yards. So, you know, Brian Litz took me under his wing and kind of taught me how to use a Kestrel and the analytics and the phone app and all that stuff. And it's kind of just jumped right in head first and started learning all that ballistic, you know, the ballistic solver. And uh, once you learn it, it's fascinating. It really is. I mean, it all kind of starts to make sense after you learn the the solver and, and all, you know, the Kestrel and the lab radar. And really, Eric, you just plug in the information and uh, you're right there. I mean, you know, there's some little, adjustments that comes with experience with you know your shooting fundamentals and your marksmanship on the rifle just like you would in f open for the u.s rifle team uh but then you know there's an element of of wind right it's always changing it's worth more at those distances uh, i think you know like the 416 barrett at two miles is one mile an hour is worth like four feet four or five feet right in there so you know you got to be within a half a mile an hour on your wind call and we don't have wind flags. So you're going off vegetation, terrain. You know, if the bullet hits, you're watching the dust fly and kind of gauging that for speed. Or if, there, if a vehicle runs by or if there's somebody else shooting before you get up there watching their dust. Uh, or watching, you know, terrain features, how they move in the, in the wind. You know, if you really are smart, you know, you go the day before and you can watch your Kestrel and utilize the mile per hour feature and then look at the weeds and tree branches or whatever and kind of gauge what it's doing, right? And using your Kestrel as a as a tool. And then while you're shooting, you can watch those same trees and limbs and dust or whatever. But it's challenging. And to be able to do it within a half mile per hour, I mean, that's kind of like, uh, you know, going back to the FTR days, that's like a... What is it? Uh, maybe uh, what is it? One mile per hour, a thousand yards with a three hundred eight is like uh, what a half minute to a minute of shift. Yeah, it's. I think it's enough to put you outside the ten ring. Yeah. So I mean, it's kind of the same deal, right? But then we get winds up to twenty, thirty miles an hour at two miles, and that's we're talking forty to sixty feet of drift, right, <laughs> at those distances. So. It's really difficult, and the whole dynamic of your tempo too. Um, you know, we we don't have to wait eight seconds for an electronic target uh, or anything like that, or wait for a slow butt puller to mm -hmm. put our target back in the air. I mean, we can turn and burn, and uh, you know, sometimes that's what we have to do when we're shooting two miles, and uh, you know, because if you don't get your rounds off and the wind changes, you're forty feet the other way. <laughs> yeah, that's. That's nuts, man. So you're doing pretty good now, aren't you? <laughs> you rank you rank number one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, with the new King of One Mile ranking, I think there's, I don't know, 
400 or 500 shooters there in the ranking all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, Alex Cords, I reached out to Alex to try to get an update on the ranking, and he said the top 40 didn't change. Mm -hmm. So I'm still at number one there. And, uh, you know, I worked my tail off last year going out to Kansas, which, you know, it's the heaviest winds in the country. I mean, they get all year, it seems like, you know, it was 20 to 30 miles per hour, you know, and so to make your job more difficult shooting in those ranges uh with those winds is really difficult um great bunch of guys out there i mean they, they got a great thing going and anybody starting out i highly recommend going to spirit point in kansas because they actually have a rookie class now where you can shoot with the rookies and you know kind of work your way up and into the you know bigger guns and and uh better shooters so it's a great atmosphere out there but um yeah, no, I was really pleased. Uh, my only goal was to shoot the 33XC and learn it because I'd never shot it before because, I, you know, we started the new uh, light class. Of course, I had one in 19 I built, and I let I lent it to Ray. Um, and he won the national championship with my rifle <laughs> before I even got a chance to shoot it. Um, so I knew it worked well, but I had never shot it very much. So I used the whole year last year just to learn the gun so that my team could be successful at King of One Mile, which is the inaugural match in Texas. Mm -hmm. So we actually went there as a team and we were able to finish first and second. So I accomplished my goal to learn the gun. And then at the same time, I you know got a good ranking out of it, but um, very challenging. It opened the door to a lot of different shooters in the community that have 338 Lapuas and 338 light edges, 33 XCs, 33 enablers, and then like all the, uh, different versions of wildcats that are out there too. So, and actually there's 300 Norma that's been playing around and uh, you know, there's different, I even, I think I even seen some Psalms in there. Um, Cause you know, the light class, we don't shoot as far as a heavy class. The light class is we're only getting out to like, you know, 2000, 2,500 and rare occasions it might go farther, but King of one mile, I think the farthest target was 2,400 yards. So, I mean, that's not a problem with your 300 Norma. But as you all well know, you get in a horse race with the big dogs, you know, yeah, you're yeah. going to have the heaviest bullet going the fastest speed and still make weight. So what's the, what are the weight limitations? Yeah, it's 26 pounds. The whole rifle has to weigh 26 pounds. And then also the caliber restriction is 338 caliber in the bore. You can use any cartridge you want. Um, there was talk of people using like a, you know, 375 neck down to 30 or 338, but, um, you know, that'd be a pretty big rifle, right? So you got your weight as a factor there, but I'm sure that somebody will come out with something that'll, you know, be testing the limits. But, uh, you know, right now the 33 XC is pretty much running the roost, I think, in the late class. It's interesting, though. I talked to an Italian F open shooter, Gian Franco Zanoni. You know him from Italy? Yep. Yeah, so I talked to him actually today, and we were just talking about rules because I, I was had uh, inspiration to travel around, and you know, doing some other King of Two Miles. They're all over the place now. I mean, we got them in Italy, Spain, mm -hmm. Argentina, Chile, Africa, uh, you know, France, Canada, Italy. I, I, I mean, they're all over. Romania, I think, is going to have one, but I'd like to catch a couple of those, you know, to to, to visit and to whatnot, but. Anyway, Sicily has a king of one mile, and uh, I think Italy has the law where they're restricted to 330 at Lapua. You can't have a 3, 33XC, mm -hmm. much like the Canadian rule where they outlawed the 416s and 50s. So they're, they they do an energy rule, right? So, oh, I see. I see. But anyway, we're going to have to meet those. We're going to have to deal with those types of rules and regulations in our sport because some of the some of the rifles and cartridges and energy levels are are banned so that's going to be interesting to see how we deal with that so it's actually good that we have the light class but i'm sure that down the road you know we'll have to come to an agreement or something to figure it out but i think people in elr are tired of changes <laughs> been a lot of changes in the last few years and you know it's a lot of money to get new rifles built and and uh you know get your barrels contoured and whatnot yeah, it, it seems, I mean, you know, just from the outside looking in, it seems like you guys are, it, it seems like there's, you know, like F-Class, right? If I if I want to shoot F-Class, I can just go and look up the rules and 
it's done, right? And it seems sure. like like you guys keep changing stuff. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're still in our infancy stages. You know, I think it took us what maybe a couple, three, four years in F class before we kind of honed in on some regulations and rules. So we're we're due. I mean, it's been five years, mm-hmm. six years now. So I think we're overdue for a standard standardized set of rules, an organization. You know, we're 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 trying hard though. But there's just so many people in different locations of the of the world and different countries, and I think there's more out there that we have to contend with. So it's going to be a little bit longer before I think we have a common ground where we can. I mean, we're close. I mean, you can go anywhere in the world and shoot competitions within a few countries, you know, here and there. I think we're getting close. Now, 338 Lapu, what, what's a good one mile, you know, excluding the XC, something that, you know, because of the rules that would work? Yeah. I mean, 330 Lapua, 300 Norma, I think those both are very sufficient to shoot a mile. Not a problem. You know, over the counter. Uh, yeah, I mean, they would do great. You know, when you get a bunch of people, you know, you get like a king of one mile, there was like 99, I think, entrance, maybe 95 or 99, something like that. And, uh, you know, that a lot of really good shooters are there. And so, you know, you're battling, you know, I think the top 10, I think eight or nine of them were 33 XCs. Mm. So <laughs> it doesn't mean that you can't win with something less, but you know, you're on the edge of performance, right? And yeah. just like with F open, right? I mean, if you're shooting something less energy, less wind drift, less ballistic efficiency, you might shoot a nine instead of holding that, that edge, that 10 edge. Right, right. With wind drift. So, so tell me about King, uh, it's called King of One Mile. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was an inaugural event. Uh, we had the, um, the NRA Nationals, I wrote the rules for that um, and organized it. In 2019, we opened it up to light class because I've been wanting light class for a long time, you know, because we're military individuals that can come and shoot. And we actually did. We had like eight or 10 uh, military snipers come and participated and they did very well. And, uh, you know, across the country, we've got a lot of people with the 338s and 300 Normas and what have you. And, uh, you know, going against, um, you know, the big heavy 50 caliber 416, 375 Shitex in anywhere from, you know, 35 to 50 pounds, that's a huge disadvantage, right? So kind of like F open and FTR, we wanted to have another class for people to, you know, bring a gun that they can compete with and, and contend. And uh, so it's opened up a whole new uh, class. And actually the Canadian King of Two Mile is actually, I think well, they're restricted to 338 and below, or they have an energy thing, but there's a lot of people using 338. So for them, it's the only rifle they can use now pretty much. I see. Cause they do jewels. Are you familiar with that, Eric? No. Uh, jewels. Well, energy. yeah. When we went to the 2017 world championship, we had, we had a speed limit. Right. So yeah, I'm not sure exactly how it all works, but <clears throat> I know that, you know, you got to meet a certain energy level and it kind of, I know that the 33 XC shouldn't have thrown a burger at, you know, 3,200, I think, or 3,150, I think will be okay. So right under, so you probably push a little bit more than that, but you're close to the energy level. <clears throat> and I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think you can use a 375 just slower, mm-hmm. but I'm not sure on all the, all the, all the laws work on that. So you know Robert Furlong, he's, he's running the show up there on that. So how, how do you go about preparing for, for one of these matches? Is, is it similar to TR? I don't think so. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, um, for me anyway, I can just, you know, talk from experience, you know, all the years of training us for team USA and, and the F class, you know, the FTR team, you know, we try to break everything down to all the fundamentals, right? So we worked on, you know, our marksmanship and our fundamentals of shooting. And, and then we uh, worked on the coaching, let the coaches practice. And then we looked at, you know, all of our rifle accuracy to make sure that we didn't have anybody shooting big groups and uh you know good communication between the coaches and shooters you know all those fundamentals of team shooting right um i tried to utilize a lot of the stuff that we learned through you know 12 years of shooting on the team we learned a lot in those 12 years and changed and you know kept getting better and better and then i 
took a lot of that stuff and went with Team Sinclair, shooting Team Sinclair over the years, and kind of adopted a lot of those same practices. And I implemented it into the Team GPG. And also, you know, I started out in 16 and 17 with uh, AB, Team AB and ELR. And we, it did really well. We won King of Female back-to-back in 16, 17. But with ELR, you know, the ballistics solver and you know what i did was i kind of perfected this over the years and i'm kind of giving stuff away here but that's okay helpful the podcast but i i do three different engines so if we show up to a match we get all the target locations we get the ranges you know getting using multiple range finders you know maybe two or three different range finders and if they all read the same distance we know that it's correct right so we're we're making sure that our distances are correct if the distance isn't correct then you're going to miss, right? And a lot of times the match directors don't always have the right distance, possibly, if they don't have the fancy range finder. But um, so we're getting the gr- the correct distance with multiple range finders. And then we, you know, get all the data. It takes me a whole, pretty much a half a day to get all the data, all the stuff, you know, the uh, direction of fire, you know, the inclination, temperature, station pressure, um, you know, distance, you know, put all that stuff into these solvers. And all these different engines, right? So you have three different engines. You have your phone app, AB phone app, the Kestrel with AB, and then the analytics with AB. So you program all this data in all three of those devices. And if it comes up within a quarter minute of angle, you know that you're good to go. If one is way off, then you're like, okay, something's wrong here. And then you have to go through all the different settings to find out which input was wrong. Right. Maybe your velocity was different. Maybe the temperature was different. Maybe the station pressure was off. All these different things, right? So you got to go, and that's kind of my, you know, my pilot checklist, right? You're double checking everything, mm-hmm. making sure everything's good. Because um, if you just had a Kestrel and you input it wrong, you wouldn't have anything to verify if it's right or not, right? But since you have all these other engines that are telling you the same thing, you're good. So once we started doing that, we then we started really doing much better uh, in our practices and performances at matches. Even if you have all the dope properly correct, um, well, just, let me say this. If you have all your elevations correct for all your, all your plates at different distances, you still have to contend with your fundamentals of shooting, your spotting and wind reading. So all that stuff is what we've been practicing. And um, for the King of One Mile, we went to James DeVoglier's ranch in Lomita, Texas, and he's got a whole complete facility down there for ELR. I mean, everything. He's got he's got shotgun, pistol, ELR, hunting course. It's awesome. So we spent a day down there, and all we did was, because we didn't know at the time, we didn't know the distances and the directions of fire, so we couldn't simulate that. So we just went and did his uh, long-range hunter's course, and we did the same thing. We got the ranges for the target. We did all the dope using three different engines we got a position then we did our communications um and the biggest thing with communications at ELR is it needs to be very very quick and you don't need to spend a lot of time talking about things that are insignificant and then it's almost like shorthand you start to learn how each other's thinking and what you need to do and kind of cutting out all the bs right for example if a shot is seen two minutes right i don't need to say hey james you just hit two minutes right I don't need to say that because it's just a waste of time talking. I'll just tell him where he needs to aim for the next shot. So I'll say top left corner of the target, send it simple. Boom. So that three or four seconds that just went by just saved us potentially what I just said, four feet for one mile an hour. Right. right. So it could have right. saved us a edge hit or a, or a center mass hit. So those are the things we concentrated on. And we went through this course of fire that he set up and they're animals at their life-size animals set up just like you would have a normal life-size elk or a wolf or what have you. And we just simply did it all day long. We just, every single shot cold bore until we were hitting everything cold bore and, and then following up with other shots. And when, when we did that, I was able to verify the, um, the uh, drag models that Brian had 
that I got from Brian at another match at Spear Point. He came out when we did a private drag model. And what that means is you take your gun and your ammunition and you shoot it at range and under the Doppler radar, and it gets you a ballistic coefficient uh, for your bullet, for your gun and for your for your ammunition. And I use the same uh, uh, drag model for our whole team because we had the same action, same barrels, same stock, same everything. They're they're identical blueprints, and there's a reason for that. For what I'm saying right now, right? And it was, you know, this is kind of funny. You as a gunsmith, what's a trip is, we were running short on time, and I would never advise this to anybody, but it was just simply we were running short on time. We were waiting for actions and barrels and whatnot to be done. You've been there before, right? Yeah. Doing a rifle before a match. <laughs> but anyway, so all the rifles were sent to my teammates and they met in Texas at this range of practice. Mm -hmm. Not one round was sent through the pipe. <laughs> Here I am in my room loading everybody's ammo, all the same load. Now, granted, use the same reamer, same action, same barrel, everything. But still, I mean, it's kind of a kind of a crapshoot there. So I'm just like, I, I had pretty much confidence because all the years shooting FTR, I've got, I had barrels that I had with the same reamer, same load, shot lights out. So I was pretty confident with the same material, same reamer, same barrel, same gunsmith. Should work the same, right? Well, anyways, we went there and all our velocities were within like 10 feet per second, except for my barrel. For some reason, my barrel was like 60 feet per second different. Maybe the headspace, I'm not sure. It was just a little bit different. So uh, not a big deal. We just we dealt with it. But what I was going to say was all of our velocities and all of our, our data we plugged in at this long range course, it was center mass pretty much every single time for elevation. So I knew that the solver was perfect. So for me, I just had to, I just had to, lower my velocity for me for my solver but everybody else is the same so i had like three people data sheets and then me separate but right. again it was probably only maybe like a half to three quarter minute at those ranges so i just always would pull a little bit lower than them but so yeah that that really uh you know we knew that uh we were prepared at that point and then we just kept practicing you know basically you know range finding the target and doing our our communication process, having a fast tempo, and then, uh, you know, we were ready to go. And uh, I can tell you this, people always ask, well, what kind of accuracy? Well, so for the last 20 years, you know, I get a new barrel for my 308 FTR gun, and I'd shoot at 500 yards in no wind, and in the evenings or in the morning with no uh, mirage, just for load development and for testing. And I generally would get anything under two inches of – you know, 10 to 20 shot groups at 500 yards, anything under two inches would be great. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I went to win a gold medal at the worlds with, with a gun that, you know, printed a 1.8 inch, uh, 10 shot group. Mm -hmm. So I knew that that was capable of, of doing well. Right. So, I mean, it's still X ring elevation, right. And, right? and no wind. Now when there's wind, it could throw different factors in there. We all know that also mirage you test in the middle of the day, it's terrible groups you know, with Mirage. Right. Oh yeah. But, um, so the same thing with these rifles, you know, they were printing, you know, inch and a half to inch and three quarter for five shots at 500 yards. So they were sub two inches, sub half minute. And, you know, we went on and, and, uh, the, another dynamic of it is, you know, it's kind of almost a lot of these teams in ELR now they're huge, right? So you only have like a two or three man team, depending on what matches you. But then all your friends are shooting with you, right? So you might have eight or ten people that are on your squad, if you will. Mm -hmm. So like Team AB or Cutting Edge Bullets or Team GPG or Sterling Precision or whatever. All these different groups, they kind of have like maybe five to ten people that share information. So if you go shoot and you come off the line, no different than F class, right? Well, hey, what'd you have on for win? Oh, I had three minutes. You know, same type of thing. But the more people that you have, the more data you have. Right. So people come off the line and they, they're going to tell you, well, for some reason, T2, man, I'm hitting low all the time. Well, it could be an updraft, downdraft, you know, things going on. So all this, you know, kind of, I don't want to call it inside information, but technical information about the range that's significant to the range is very helpful if you have more shooters in your squad. And I think 
I've seen PRS matches too. They kind of do the same thing. You know, they've got right. friends that are shooting behind them and they kind of share what maybe they had on for windage and whatnot. So I think it exists everywhere, but it's interesting phenomenon where, you know, this is kind of developing into like almost like a squad type of competition. Now, even though the wind changes all the time, mm -hmm. it still gives you a starting point. So with that frame of mind and, you know, that frame of mind, you know, we kind of took the king of one mile line like that. You know, we were going to take good notes when we were shooting the wind and certain targets, the way they respond, we react. Um, so it was me and James, we shot first and second out of our four man team. It's two, two man teams. And we did well, we didn't do well enough. I think I missed the, the, the uh, shoot off or the uh, finals by one, one position, which could be one hit anywhere. So very close. And then right. uh, with the information we learned from me and James, we applied to, to Ray and Clay and they finished one, two. Wow. Clay went 18 for 18. Wow. Out to, you know, 20, 20, 100, some, 20 something hundred yards, uh, didn't miss one target. I mean, center mast every single plate all the way out. And man, that was awesome for me, you know, being the captain and do, loading all the ammo and, and all ballistics and wind and, and everybody's learning as we go too. So now with my team, I mean, Clay is a smart guy, you know, he owns a long shot cameras, uh, company and he just bought another security company and very intelligent young man and very calm. And he just, I mean, he didn't, even, he's never shot competition ever in his life. <laughs> So he grabbed that rifle and one king one mile, right? So yeah. I'm really looking forward to, you know, years to come, how we can perform as a team. But I mean, it really is a team effort, you know, working all together. It's kind of a team within a team, if you will. And I think you have that in F open, right? I mean, you have look oh, yeah. who a team needs to come off a line and really in front of you and say, hey, you know, three well, and a half minutes. Well, well we're usually on the same relay. As you, know, in F, as you know, in F class, we're usually on the same relay when. Yeah. So sure. it's it's hard to do that, but or but maybe I, another relay. You have another relay, maybe that people are shooting too. But yeah, now now I don't know. The only difference want, is in ELR we don't have spotters. Yeah, <laughs> I don't I don't know if you want to tell me this or not, but I'm going to ask yeah. anyway. <laughs> yeah. So you talk about your rifle builds and all that. Okay, can you can you elaborate on on what kind of components? You know, actions, barrels, stocks. Yeah, whatever? absolutely. I mean, I I I have a pretty good idea what kind of stocks you use. <laughs> yeah, let me actually just, no, that's a good, good idea. Just uh, by well, looking me, at your uh, your hoodie there. Yeah, but, well, I got this. This is a new. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Okay. Yeah, I see it. I see it. This is a new Manners LRT 2.0, and uh, actually, you know, I was a longtime shooter from McMillan, and then uh, when Kelly passed away, it was tragic for a lot of people. For the whole shooting world, it was tragic. Um, you know, Tom had mentioned a long time that he'd like to work with me and design some new stocks for ELR and, and, uh, whatnot. So, you know, I went ahead and jumped on board with Tom and, you know, he was willing to do a lot of, uh, R and D and, and custom stuff. And I think, you know, the new owners of McMillan aren't ready to do that quite yet, you know, cause they got a tight budget, but anyways, um, this is LRT 2.0 and for ELR, it's a dream. We got a, we got a spot for a rail up front for a prism or, a uh, you know, uh, night force makes these prisms mm -hmm. so they, they'll mount on this rail it's it's embedded with bushing so you can just mount a rail on top of there and, and mount it i don't know if you can see there or not yeah, yeah but, i can see and then all or also for the three and four and five mile stuff we got the charlie and delta tacom hq charlie and delta mm -hmm. so basically um you know your as your rifle is your scope you're looking through the charlie which projects you know up to the new one i'm going to be getting is like 2500 minutes of angle and then the delta just moves it over on the other side of the barrel but that'll be mounted so the stock will be able to mount any type of prism you want and then um the thing that really makes it nice is you got this thumb wheel adjustment now can you see that mm -hmm. yeah so that's a micro adjustment and this is like version two or three now he's tom's really put a lot of effort into this you know to make it better for us you know He's got a lot of passion. He likes to shoot. He tore it up at King of Two Mile this year. We're very lucky to have him because he's putting money and time into this, which is going to enhance our ability to shoot better. But we're very lucky to have him in the sport. But anyways, this is a micro adjustment. So when you're on the rifle and, you know, you're, you're aimed in with your, uh, you know, your gross movement with your bipod and your rear bag. And then if you need to do a micro adjustment with recoil, 
management, you know, you can just use your thumb wheel really quick um, and then make shots. You know, at these long range shots, I mean, you got to, you have to be just as steady or steadier than you would in F open or FTR. I mean, um, and you have to have good follow, quick follow up shots. Another thing they did was they um, put this uh, weight system. And what's nice about this is, you know, obviously you can adjust your length of pull for different shooters, but also you can add up to three, four pounds of weight, which gives you that heavier weight to the rear. A lot of these barrels and stuff on these big guns are really, really big contour. So it's top heavy. So this kind of, you know, puts the weight to the rear. Now on the F, back in the F class days for the U.S. team, it was like 30% weight to the rear of the stock for a lot of those um, old stocks we used to run, like 30% to the rear mm -hmm. on a scale. And it gave us a lot better recoil management. Now this gun, it tracks so straight and in, in the recoil, it just tra it, it tracks straight back so that when you're back on target immediately, where some of the older versions that were top heavier, I mean, you'd be a way off the target and, you, and you'd have to actually take your magnification and go way down to seven to find your target again because it was recoiling so much and moving you around. Well, that's going to, that's going to take you out of the competition because you got to be shooting faster, not only to make the whole um, course of fire, but also to take advantage of, you know, less wind movement in between shots. So anyway, um, see, so they added that, the micro adjustment, the prism rail, and then uh, obviously, you know, his own internal um, advancements, which, I, I can't talk about, but magic, you know, magic. It, it has a little magic. Yeah. But I mean, this <laughs> thing, you know, I think I got a test sample when I first tried it. I mean, this is the kind of stuff at 500 yards, you know? Wow. I mean, obviously people say, well, it's only a three shot group. Well, when you're shooting 460 in Barrett, it's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> that's you know, about so $50 we, worth. That's a $50 group right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but let me go to the light gun. He built a new light gun too. And I'll go through this real quick. So I'll go from start to finish here on the front. So you got a David Tubb break. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously it's in 33XC. That's David Tubb's creation. And then obviously, you know, Night Force, the Night Force 7 to 35 ATEC R with the new, this is the new um, Accutech bipod with my P skis. Mm -hmm. um, when I was testing the original flat, big pants feet, I was getting like the new rule with the folding bipods. You know, we went from the Phoenix to the Accutech because the rule change. Right. And uh, I was getting like, you know, one minute of angle groups with the, with the Accutech, you know, with those pan feet. And I told Felipe, I'm like, hey, dude, send me some, you know, sleds. You know, we talked about it. And he designed these. It went from like one minute down to inch and a half inch just from the feet. Wow. Yep. So one very little time, right? What and, distance uh, were you yeah, shooting? Yeah, I told him, I said, what, send. What distance were you shooting these groups at? 500 yards. So you went from five inches to down to one, one and a half or Yeah, something? it was like, you know, wow. three to five inch groups, you know. Um, but then these are like inch and a half, two inches consistently. Yeah. So unbelievable, you know. And then Ray Gross makes the... Um, you know, the mat from the FTR days, you probably remember them. There's a lot of them around, but, you know, he makes the the mat like this. You've seen those before, haven't yeah, you? Yeah. Yeah. So though this mat with those ski feet, I mean, the group the groups at 500 went down to like one and a half. And I, and I told Felipe it was a home run. You know, I mean, that's awesome, right? So we used that. We used that bipod in the King of One Mile and, and produced unbelievable accuracy. I mean, Clay was just center punching everything all the way out, you know, no misses. And then obviously that's the, now this stock, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this one or not, but this is the um, Manners F open stock. And I told uh, uh, Tom, I'm like, Hey dude, let's get something for light class. And he says, all right, we'll do the F open. And then we'll put the ELR rear butt plate on it. Mm -hmm. And we tried to put the micro adjustment in here, but there's not enough room. But that's okay. I mean, we can still use the same system of a rear bag to go forward and backward. And and we're not shooting the crazy long distances um, yet. Um, but until then, you know, it, 
we still have that bag that's angled that we can just go forward and backward for elevation. Right, right. And then obviously we also put another uh, um, prism out for the Charlie, the tech, tech on Charlie or the Night Force prism mounts up here. Um, at Spear Point in the spring, they have a match that goes up to 4,000. So, you know, you need to have a prism because most of these scopes won't only go like, you know, 120, 130 minute of angle. So you got to have that extra prism to go out to those distances. Um, and then uh, obviously we're running a bat, CTH, dual port, left load, right eject. Um, it's quicker. And then uh, using Bix and Andy trigger. Um, and then uh, the rear uh, butt plate is, a, is the ELR adjustable butt plate. So you can yeah. add, subtract weight for recoil management. And uh, we're using the Bartline barrel with the uh, Manson reamer. And uh, the ammunition is the Peterson brass, 33XC Peterson brass, 300 burger, uh, Vitivori, uh powder is in the 565 and uh, federal 250 m primers and they're their lights out i mean absolutely unbelievable accurate i mean it feels like a 308 when you're shooting it with the stock system and you, the, you guys and don't the, have or late turn bullets are not a big thing in one mile competitions um people use them yeah i mean i i use cutting edge in um 19 ray used them to win the NRA national championship cutting edge. Um, so they work great too. Absolutely work great. Um, the barrels that I had spun up were nine and a half twists. Okay. So, I mean, the 300 burger worked great. I mean, I tested them out and it worked great. So, you know, obviously I'm a capstone, uh, sponsored shooter. So, um, I went ahead and went with the burger, the nine and a half twist. And not only that, but one of the things too, that's kind of a benefit is the burger signature or the, I should say the, the standard bullet, you know, the Hornies and the burgers, they make a black spot the size of a softball at 3000 yards. Yeah. And so you can see it with your naked eye. So I, when I was talking to uh, George Gardner, he told me that he says the yeah. left turn bullets are great, but they don't, they don't make a, yeah. you hardly see it. It is a little easier to see the, the the hornies and the burgers um and i mentioned george uh you know hats off to him too he built the two rifles the two team rifles that took first and second at king of one mile so they did, they did a great job you know george and the crew there i mean they're just hammers so with george gardner you know uh building those and then you know manners of the stock i just can't be happier and the, you know the bad action Bartland barrel and night force scope. I mean, it's a solid package. But our whole team was running them, and uh, you know, this rifle was right here is the one I shot all year in Kansas. And uh, you know, I think my best run was um, I ran T1 through T8 out to 2907. And I how you get ranked is you have to have at least two impacts out of five um, for that distance to count, and you have to do it consistently. So if you miss one target. Or only hit one out of five at one target, the whole run doesn't count. So you got to hit all eight plates at least twice for it to count, the distance to count. Does that make sense? No. Explain it a different way. <laughs> well, so they don't want someone just to get lucky and hit a distance. They okay, want to be so able to let, shoot. Let me let me let me run it by you. Maybe, maybe sure. See if I understand. So you have eight plates. Yep. And you have to hit them. So you, you is it hit? what they call hit to move on or, or hit or miss. You just keep going. Well, their match is hit or miss, but to be qualified for the distance, uh, they want you to show consistency and to show consistency, you have to be every single plate at least two times for that distance to count. I got it now. So, so yeah. for example, what are the distances? Uh, well, it starts at five, 1500 yards and it goes to 2,900. Okay. So I'm going to keep it simple and I'm just going to keep it in 500 yard increments just for, for this right. discussion, 500, sure. 1000, 1500, 2000, yeah. 2500. So to right. get qualified for 2500, you have to hit all the other targets at least twice for the last yep. one to count. Correct. Ah, that's hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, in Kansas, you know, those guys, they're shooters, man. They, uh, they're, they're shooting in wind. That's, you know, 20, 20 mile hours 
common, you know. Um, so it's tough, you know, with a 338 mullet at 2,900 yards to hit two for five. I mean, that's tough, you know. I mean, uh, how far did you make it? Uh, 2907. Wow. Yeah, I went all the way to 2907. You know, obviously, too, I mean, this goes back to teamwork, you know, practicing spotting and wind reading and communication. I mean, that's all we do anymore when we practice. We practice those things. We got our rifles dialed in and our ammunition dialed in and our ballistics are, is dialed in, but now we're practicing communication, shooting quickly, and then spotting is huge um, for ELR. That's everything, right? So during the season, I had um, Shane and Jacqueline Bryan uh, sitting with me since we're all manners shooters, mm -hmm. but they actually spotted for me. They did a great job. Um, And they're the ones that when I made that run, they were, they were helping me out. So kudos to them, you know, but I mean, it's, it's tough. I mean, there's so many times I go to matches where I hear I'm watching and observing and it's not, I mean, you hear a lot where people say, you know, no call, no call. And it's very frustrating to the shooter because it's hitting somewhere, but he just doesn't know where, but it's, it's kind of a, you know, we're used to getting X's, X's, tens, X's, right. And if we shoot a nine, it's like, You know, you hear a bunch of other people, oh, man, I love drop one, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But so for ELR, you know, I mean, when you have no hits, it's it's just different mentally, I think. Yeah. But just understanding that, you know, like I said, if you only hit two for five at every plate, it doesn't sound that great. But maybe nobody hit the last three targets. Nobody even hit. So it's eight targets. So this is kind of like what they would call troop line. You, you shoot them all in a row. Um, no, they actually they actually split them up in groups where you shoot two targets oh. and it could be two days, right? So you do two targets and then you get off the line, come back and shoot two more, get off the line. This might be hours later. So the wind has totally changed. Right. So you do two, two and two, three relays in a day, and then come back another day and shoot two and two again. So you might shoot, you know, four different relays or five different relays. For how many, days. how many? Okay. So, so eight different targets how and you shoot two targets at a time yeah you'll shoot one target and then advance to the next target it's hit it's not and it's not hit or miss it is hit or miss yeah so you don't have to hit it to advance so right. every so, single so, target but, but they give you two targets to shoot at per right i'm gonna call it a relay because yeah. that's what i'm used to yep. um the, yep so how much time do they give you You know, I don't remember what they gave us. Um, it's not that much. It's about 30 seconds per shot, I think. Well, how many shots so, are you allowed? Um, it's 10 shots per relay. So it's five and five. Five shots on one target, oh, five shots on the other. I see. Yep. But, I mean, it's every that's spear point. Now, king of one mile, um, they, you know, they go, the, you run your whole qualification, you just run it all at once all the targets and i think there was six targets i think if i remember correctly so you run all six targets and you run it run it through and then you know you get your score and at the end of the end of the two days of qualification they take the top uh was it 15 or whatever 15 or 19 shooters out of 100 so maybe top 20 or something does it take that and then long those guys to go into the next farther distance targets So depending on what match you go to, there's different kind of course of fire. I've been wanting to, um, you know, I talked about this last time on your podcast. I think we talked about, um, you know, changing the format to where, you know, if you get a bad relay or a bad draw, I mean, if you get Drew, the first shooter in the morning, you'd have three miles per hour wind. I was going to say. And then if you shoot at two o'clock in the afternoon, you have 25 miles an hour wind. That's what I was going to say. Why don't. You know, and again, I don't know. It seems like it takes a long time, but couldn't you just let everybody shoot all the targets multiple times a day and keep a score? You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I thought about this many hours, you know, driving to Kansas and back, it was like 30 hours, right? Mm -hmm. So you're thinking about how you could make things, you know, I mean, I'm not saying I want to change what they do. They, they got a great operation, but as far as the sport goes, you know, to make it more fair, to measure your ability. I think that the only way you could, we could do it is a shoot off format, just like the V2 challenge. So you have two guys in the same conditions, same distance targets, same amount of time, 
and they just shoot off and the winner advanced to the next round. That's really the only way we can do it. And it makes sense, right? An ELR would be great for those conditions. So it's just, you, all you have to do is just beat the person next to you in the same conditions. Mm -hmm. And then nobody can say, well, you got, you know, top 10, you know, when you were only had five mile an hour win, I had to shoot in 30 mile an hour win. Yeah. Yeah. Because even if, if it's a two mile an hour win, only one guy can make it. Only one yeah. shooter can, can get through there because. So that's kind of what, that's kind of what we're battling right now, Eric, is we're still kind of in our infancy stages, trying to get the rules straightened out, weight, caliber. And then we're trying to also, you know, they're, they're you know, change up the ranking systems too. And, and uh, you know, like Kansas match, I mean, like some of these PRS matches, I mean, literally you got to be standing by your computer and getting ready to push send right at the, or like, you know, Southwest Nationals, right? Yeah. Same thing. Yeah, it Hard used to, to be in, that way. I don't, I don't think it's that way anymore. No. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. But anyway, uh, yeah. what about. But no, I think that I, I'm trying this year, I'm going to really try hard to, to organize a match to have people try it out and see what they think. And, uh, but I think that would solve a lot of issues. I think that would help, help with keeping things fair. Yeah. So if you're on the clock, that, that explains why you have to be very efficient with your calls, right? Absolutely. So, so I mean, really, I mean, I, I mean, we're getting to the point now where not much is said. I mean, we're just telling them where to aim. And if it's a questionable call where it hit, then maybe we have some dialogue. But, I mean, it needs to be quick. It needs to be fast. Most of the better scores are the faster shooters. Not all the time. You know, every now and then you might have a switch and you might get totally annihilated with it if you don't catch it. But right. um, at these distances, though, very difficult to see the impacts. You know, that's why we went with the bigger cartridges, just have more energy hit the ground and see the splash. But um, the do biggest you, thing. Do you, yeah. what, what, so do you have a coach telling you, telling you where to hold? I mean, it sounds like you do. And well, that's just it. You know, I mean, now we're getting on to two man teams. It used to be three man teams back in the, you know, 16, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. And then they switched it to two man teams. So now it's only two people. So, you know, there's one less set of eyes. Right. Right. So it's just between you and your uh, spotter to be able to communicate with each other. How are you going to do that to make it very efficient and fast? Because if you spend time, you know, discussing where you hit, the wind's changing. So you, you, you know, the way I look at it is you just shot one. If you had a miss, you earned it. You better make use of it, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, that sounds interesting. It sounds like uh, it can be quite stressful if it's windy. Like, how how do you approach that? So let, let's talk about that. You, you, you talked about earlier how, how, you know, you use three different solvers and all that, and it takes yeah. you half a day. But Do they tell you ahead of time when, I assume they tell you when you're going to shoot? Let's say, hey, Paul, you're up at 2 p.m., yep. right? Yeah, there's a list that's made generally the morning of or the night before your shooting order. Okay, so yep. then you're allowed to watch other shooters shoot yep. and kind of kind of keep sure. an eye on where they're missing. Yeah, you can watch the wind, watch other shooters. Can you hear their calls? Sure. Are you close yeah, enough? Yeah, you can hear the calls. Uh, if they're speaking English, I guess. <laughs> So we had a team okay, speaking so, another language. So uh, okay, I thing, see but, what you're saying. Yeah. So there's yeah, you, you kind of follow along, but still, no matter what, if you're squatted in the afternoon when it's just heavier, switchier wind, it's just much more difficult. You know, I mean, like I said, you got to keep it within a half mile per hour at two miles to keep it on plate. The velocity is like oh eight to ten miles per hour, or I'm sorry, eight to ten feet per second. Um, with velocity will take you out plate. Right. So you got to have single digit SD, single digit extreme spread to stay on impacts. And then, so then the question is if you hit low, um, was it the wind? Was it you? Was it a slow round? I mean, you'd have to make a guess, right? Are you allowed so, to run chronographs on the clock or no? They do. They are allowing, um, as long as uh, it comes attached to the rifle. Okay. Well, have you seen that? I'm sure you've seen it. That whatever small device, it's a chronograph. Yeah. Yeah. I forget what it's called. 
Well, that's, you know, that's yeah, the magne- change. The, some people are using the magneto speed. I know David Tubster was one of the first ones to use it. Now a lot of people are following suit. That's right. Chase had one attached to his rifle. Yeah. That's, yeah. So, man, I'm, I'm trying to process this whole thing because it's, uh, you know, I, I guess, I guess it helps if, like you said, if, if your teammates are shooting the same cartridge or as close as possible, cause you know, you can get their dope, right? Yeah. And vice I mean, versa. It's, um, it helps out the whole team with kind of having a good starting point. Right. I mean, once you start shooting, it's on you as a shooter, your fundamentals and your communication with your shooter, and the wind could be different. Not always. Sometimes, you know, the wind conditions are pretty steady throughout the whole day. Um, not in Kansas, obviously, but like when we shot the nationals in, in uh, Camp Atterbury in Indiana, yeah, pretty much everybody had the same conditions, mm-hmm. pretty calm, pretty steady. Um, so I would say any place in the country that it wouldn't apply would be Kansas. I mean, you could go shoot there and within an hour and it'd be a totally different direction and twice the wind speed. I mean, it could be totally different, but it just kind of gives you more data, more input, not only just for wind, but like, for example, a king of two mile, you know, we'll have the first shooter get up there for the team and I'll have all the data pre-done the way it is for the solver. And then maybe I'll be watching other teams and everybody's running short at like this one target. Well, why is that? Are they all wrong with their dope? The distance maybe is off speed. You know, what is the reason? Well, and then we were short. I'm like, well, there must be something going on in some type of environmental condition that we're not seeing a downdraft and updraft, you know, whatever it's a conditional thing. Or, you know, you've seen it too, Eric, where you're at certain ranges at certain yardages and you'll have this headwind and then there's, you know, bumps in the range and you're getting these nine, uh, 12 o'clock nines out of, you know, when you get a headwind or something or a certain wind condition could change, you get those environmental changes. Right. So it's even more profound when you shoot extreme long range, right? You get more profound changes like that. So having that feedback from the shooters before you, like within a king of one mile, you know, by the time we got to our third and fourth shooters, we had all that stuff ironed out. We knew those little, little tiny things. Well, that one over there, for some reason, it's not doing what it's showing. We need to do this. Well, so we made the changes. So it's kind of interesting. You know, you kind of, like I said, it's kind of a team within a team within a game, right? So yeah. a lot of information there. Now the only now that could all change if it's a different format. It all change, right? If you do it in isolation, where you well, we talked about this before in the last podcast, where you kind of isolate everybody and not have the information being shared, it would change things. Or another person just brought up last week, what if we shoot, you know, like we do in uh, F class individual. Yeah. You know, yeah. spot for yourself. That'd be interesting. That would be for sure. So yeah. explain to me how this, uh, cause I've seen you shoot three, four miles and, and beyond. Yeah. What, is that a competition or is that just for fun? No, just for fun. Um, you know, gosh, when I was a kid shooting a BB gun, just to see how far I could knock a pop can off, you know, a uh, branch or tree, whatever. And it was always infatuated with distance shooting and, you know, and then uh, I got out of the Marine Corps and, you know, I want to get a, my first rifle ever was a 300 Winchester Magnum that Gail McMillan uh, designed and built for me along with his son Rock. And, you know, I didn't, I wanted to go shoot Camp Perry. That that was all there was back then, you know, was NRA long range. And I wanted to shoot the Wimbledon Cup or the Leech Cup. Those are my goals. And, but also I just wanted to take it out and see if I can shoot a mile, you know, and it wasn't that successful. It, I think I might have hit like one out of 10 and they were coming in, you know, sideways, you know, they were keyholing, wasn't even stable. I didn't even know what that was all about back then, yeah. you know, barrel twist and stability and all that. But, um, so, you know, I've always had that love and kind of like Chase Stroud, you know, he's got the same, you know, and there's, there's a few of us out there that just kind of see how far we can go. So that's kind of where it came for me is I love to shoot the sport and the competition. And um, actually, you know, we did the first world record event was in Vegas in Pahrump. And we made a rule of three for three cold bore mm-hmm. on a 36 inch plate. 
And uh, I think me and John Armstrong, we hit, oh, man, it was like 1,500 yards or something like that, three for three. It was the first world record. And then and then uh, Nate Stalter, Dave Tubbs' son-in-law, married Christy, he, I think, went a mile and maybe 2,000 yards. Anyways, that was like the first kind of, you know, three for three world records. Well, that's a rule-based world record event, right, where everybody's in the same rules. The three, four mile thing, that's just exhibition shooting, you know, and there's debate, right? The guy that just shot 4.4 miles, he beat our four mile impact. It is what it is. I mean, they're having fun to call it a world record. I don't think that that's probably right. I mean, I think that if you were to have a set of rules and invite everybody to go do a competition, then it'd be a a world record. But I mean, there's no rules, right? So it's just an exhibition in my mind, right? You're just going out and having fun. I don't consider what we did any record. It was just a personal best of something we like to do. And things that we learn from doing those things are priceless. I mean, we learned about ballistics, uh, all kinds of things, bullet. I mean, that's that's one of the things that I'll share with you. Um, back in the day when we were doing, you know, the two miles and three miles and four miles attempts, at the same time, we were testing our products to see how well they would shoot at longer ranges to help us at king of two miles or king of one mile so you know we had every single bullet known to man and we're out there testing to see how they'd perform in our rifles now i'm not going to say that a particular brand is better for everybody we all know that different barrel twists different barrel different uh reamer dimensions there's a lot of things that can affect that bullet flight right but i will tell you this out of our rifles you know there's a reason why we're shooting cutting edge bullets. I'll tell you that Mm -hmm. at four miles, we were printing groups in the ground that were 10 and 15 foot three shot groups. Okay. So hang on, on, Paul. Yeah. (laughs) Let me process that because that sounds massive, but it's It's not, it's it's a long, it's less than, it's less than two minutes. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. I, I had to process yeah. that because you know, you, you know, you're like, oh, it's yeah, it's, it's a two, it's a, it's a minute. And a half I, I had, to, I had to stop. I had to stop and figure out if that was good or bad. Honestly, yeah, it's it, okay. So if you do the so math, it's, good. it's about <laughs> you know four miles is what seven <laughs> seven foot minute of angle, something like that. Yeah, it's 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 I don't know. It's so it's, it's seven thousand seventy yards, whatever. Yeah, so it's like, seventy inches. Yeah, but and it's one point oh four seven times that. Yeah, so yeah, it'd well, be like I guess the point oh four seven really matters when you when you got that many. Yeah, so let's just call it seven feet. I don't do the math here, but let's just call yeah, it seven so foot two MOA. So you so that's two MOA group at four miles, Eric. Yeah, yeah. And we did it. We did it like a handful of times. It wasn't just like they were splattering all over the countryside. <laughs> I mean, we were like it was like artillery. Shoot three shots and wait. Tung, tung, tung. Yeah. Okay. A little bit right, a little bit up. Send it. <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, we got close enough to make an impact. But yeah. again, there's things that we learned with testing the bullets. Some bullets were coming in like a helicopter. Brrr. I mean, they weren't <laughs> even stable. So, so uh, again, from the outside looking in, uh, that whole, you know, world record thing. It, it, I think it really hurts your, your sport. I'm going to call it your sport because that's what you yeah. do now. Because, um, you know, and you've probably seen the threads on Facebook and social media and Instagram sure. where, where people are just well, laughing. I, I, they're just laughing yeah. at, at the, at the I'm going to call it absurdity of, of the, the claims, right? right? That it's, it's a world record. Uh, I think if they called it like what you called it earlier, uh, exhibition, exhibition shooting, I think a lot of people would say, yeah, okay, that's cool. They, Took yep. 70 shots or however many, but yeah, yeah man, that's still pretty cool, you know. Whereas yeah, if you call it a, as, if you call it a world record, uh, yeah, that's the that's the problem. You know, again, there's a lot of opinions on this, and again, know, that's just me from the outside maker, looking but, in, and 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 from yeah. seeing all the memes and all the all the stuff that that they, you know, it just seems like it's because yeah. guess what? Those are the ones that go viral, right? And those and a lot of people that have never heard of ELR, that's how they're going to hear about ELR the, for the first time ever, which is yep. not a good. Well, I think as long as you explain to people what you're doing, what the purpose is that it's not a competition, that it's an exhibition, and we're studying the development of bullets or 
flight or ballistic solver, or whatever it is, because we've learned a lot from doing those things. I'll give you a for instance. One day we were shooting, it was the same temperature, same station pressure, same direction of fire, same target, same gun, same ammo, same everything. From one day to the next, we had a hundred minute of angle different elevation. Wow. Now, what, what do you think that caused <laughs> that? Crazy. Well, density There's altitude, only one thing right? that we figured out that was different. Okay. All right. Let me, let me think about it. A hundred minutes. Everything, yep. you said everything was the same? Everything was the same. Temperature, station pressure, direction of fire, distance, same velocity, same bullet, same everything. But, but we had a hundred minutes difference elevation. Dude, I don't know. What the hell was it? <laughs> well, we we're not 100% sure, but I think between a lot of us, really in all the data and look at everything, we feel it was light. It was the, the only difference that was one day it was cloudy, the other day it was clear. Oh, okay. So, you yeah, know, how sometimes that, that, you're shooting that, F open match. Yeah, I mean, I've had, cloudy, I've had clear it. Day, it could be a minute of angle. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, when you go that far. Yeah. Right. But four miles, it's. You know, it's all through your scope. But, but anyways, I mean, there's tons of other things that we learned though doing it. Um, one of the things, obviously, the most important thing was you know our ballistics and our solver at those extreme ranges. Um, we learned our, what what works best, right? Right. And actually, back in 2016, when I was kind of preparing for the king of two mile with team AB and 17. And that's all I did was I shot at a mile all the time to learn what was the best performance for that. And we come up with the, with the 400 grain cutting edge laser at a mile was lights out. And, you know, obviously Derek ended up winning with that combination. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just lights out. So, you know, just like you, you know, all the testing that you do, it's just as just as critical in ELR where we have to test our rifle accuracy and performance and consistency. But then one more caveat is it's not a known distance like you guys shoot. We also, when we show up at a match, they don't announce the distances. So we have to wait until the morning or the night, night before to get all the distances, to start doing all our homework, to build building our solvers, to building our, I mean, you got to build everything. You have to build your wind chart for that distance and how much wind's going to affect it at that distance for every single target mm -hmm. time of flight for the spotter. So let's say you're shooting two miles. It's about seven seconds time of flight. Well, when I'm spotting and the, and the gun goes, boom, I'm counting off of my head. 1,001, 1,002 to 1,000, about six. And then that's when I relax my eyes and I just kind of open them and relax them because that long, I mean, I might just blink, you know, yeah. and there's been many times where I've been watching newer shooters. They'll say no call bullet hasn't even landed yet i mean they're two seconds yeah. early and they take their heads yeah. off the scope they don't realize it yeah well there's just so much that goes into it you know to understand the time of flight and then uh you know uh, the wind and all that you know it's 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 difficult and you know, like in kansas uh the 2900 the 2907 yard plate there was only like two minutes of angle on each side before there was trees so you had like about a four or five minute hole mm -hmm. at 2,900 yards. Well, you better, your wind better be ready. Good. Yeah. Cause, <laughs> because if you it's miss it, you're in the trees. Hole. Yeah. 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 That's very interesting. But, you know, back to the, the, um, three and four mile stuff, you know, we just have fun with it. You know, we'll never claim anything because it's not a competition at all. It's just an exhibition practice type thing. Um, maybe someday we'll have something to where, we can get together and have a competition or whatever. But until then, I, I my belief, it's just an exhibition shot. It'd be practice. hard to have a competition where you're missing 70 times, you know? <laughs> yeah. That'd cost a lot of money, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man. That's maybe, you know, we, we talked about, we threw around the idea, maybe like uh 10 round, 10 rounds at a plate, three different plates or something. I don't know. I, it, you know, I don't know if it's going to happen, but there, there might be something in the future for something like that. I mean, look at right now in 2015, I think they didn't hit even anything past 2000 yards in the competition. Yeah. George said he, he won a Coke or something from you. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, 
Yeah, that was uh, he was betting that nobody would hit the plate, and I said they would, and they didn't. So I I owed him a coke, but <laughs> because the year prior to that we had three three impacts, uh-huh. and then last year we had what one maybe, but yeah, it's 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 hard. If they raise the, I tell you what, I you know again this is just different format, but if you, I always think that you know. When you get to the two mile plate, if they raise it to like ten rounds, you'd have a lot more impacts. Because I mean, um, you know, they're, they're, most people are right there. You know, they're just dialing in, and then all of a sudden they run out of ammo. One of the things that when we did the four mile shoot, we talk about repeatability, right? Well, it took us like twenty rounds just before we saw the first impact, where we could adjust it because we were the ballistic was off for many different reasons. But I won't go into that. But anyways, what I will tell you this is once we found where the bullet was, and then we took us like five or 10 shots to get it up to the target. And then we finally hit it. Mm-hmm. Well, then, but after that, the next day, Derek got on the rifle the next day. It's two minutes from the target, the first shot, mm-hmm. cold bore the next day. Mm-hmm. So once we had our zero, it's just like anything else. You know, once you get your zero, you can go back and you, you're going to come within a minute or two, right? Right. Same thing at four miles within two minutes of angle. Now, the disparity is though the wind drift, right? At four miles, it's like, you know, you got to get them off pretty fast. And then you got to be lucky that that two minute of angle group is somewhere around the target. So, you know, I mean, is it uh, practical? No, I don't think so. But things we learn from it and the fun factor, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. Yeah, I may have to. Give it a try one of these days. Yeah, I, we'll have to. I'm, I'm like, I'm liking this this one mile thing. Like, honestly, yeah. like to jump in because I could probably just, I could honestly just throw a bipod on one of my F open rifles and yeah, and go shoot. Well, I'll tell you what, Eric, I've got an extra rifle. You let me know, and we'll go to a match together. I'll bring the rifle and ammunition. Oh man, yeah. Uh, and I'll tell you this, <laughs> I don't know about I don't know about uh, other folks. I'm sure that they'd probably chime in. But um, and this has been several years ago, too. I did a outdoor magazine with Mike Avery, uh, me and Mitch Fitzpatrick. It was a lethal mag way back, I don't know, 16, 17. It was live. It was a live uh, show. And uh, we all were hitting the middle of the, middle of the target. It was a long-range target at mile, whatever, 1,700 yards. And I was just letting everybody shoot. I shot a few times. Mitch shot a few times. The Mike Avery, the host, shot a few times. And his first shot, he, I think his first or second shot, he was like six inches from the center of the, of the target we were aiming at. Anyways, when we were all done shooting and we cut the feet off for the show, it was a success. Everybody laughed. And then me and John Drolly, or I forget, I forget who it was, we went down to the target to pack it up. There was a group down there that was like 12 <laughs> inches around. All those people that shot kept it in the 12 inch circle. Wow. It was like 10 or 10 or 12 shots in a 12 inch circle, different shooters, mm-hmm. different conditions. So I'm just saying that a mile is not safe anymore. Mm. I mean, a lot of people are cleaning targets at a mile now. It's pretty easy now for ELR guys. So it's definitely improved with, you know, and I credit, uh, you know, the scopes, the barrels the reamers, the actions, the stock designs, everything's getting better. The ballistic solvers, you know, the stuff that Brian Litz is doing in the mobile lab with all the, uh, you know, the custom drag models and stuff. That's huge. It's huge. I mean, I'll tell you this, we did the uh, hunter's course at KVR out at James DeVoglier's ranch in Texas. And that was our training practice before the King of One Mile. And we all just simply range find the uh, the animal and we use the new um, the new um, six hour 10x mm-hmm. you familiar with that no so it's a range finder that six hour makes it's it's called the six hour 10x and it it'll hit targets out to like you know two miles easy wow. right not a problem but inside uh, I think, you know, Nick Vitaldo was involved in that with all the design of the, of the solutions and, and software, but it gives you all the information 
in a heads up display in, 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 inside the rangefinder. So I was wanting to test that. And I had my Kestrel and the rangefinder, and I was doing two different engines, right? And I range find the target and go off the data that's in this, the bullet, the bullet that's programmed and it goes into this. Mm -hmm. So it tells me exactly what my bullet is for a certain distance. And then I use the Kestrel. They're the same. First three or four or five targets, center mass, center mass, center mass. We just kept going all day long, just hitting the center of the targets. We might get a little bit of drift for the wind errors, you know, the miscalculations of wind, but they were mm -hmm. all right in there, Eric, all the way out to, you know, 2,000 yards on a wolf and a coyote and small deer and unbelievable. I mean, unbelievable, the technology that's there now. And, you know, that's my roots is hunting, right? I mean, I was a hunter before any of this stuff. And so now when I go hunting and having these devices and the knowledge from what I'm doing in the ELR, it's, it's too awesome. easy. It's too awesome. easy now, ain't it? Yeah. Yeah. But that's no, we we'll definitely have to get you out and, uh, well, I'm 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 getting ready for the for the F class World Championship right now. I know. That's, that's, but after after that. that, yeah, after that, I'm gonna I'm gonna have some free time to play around. Uh, it's you know what it's like to get ready for World Championship. Uh, oh yeah, especially yeah. I was I was considering going over there, um, just as an individual, but that's a hefty, uh, long way to go. Yeah. I wonder. You know? I kind of wish they would make they would do the World Championship yearly you know the the f class yeah what has it been now it's Since been 17 so 17 six years yeah <laughs> it's crazy they're already ready for another cycle right yeah but you know i kind of wish because you know to be a world champion of course which derek is it's it doesn't come around very often the opportunity and even though once you have it it's dude it's you gotta beat the best shooters in the world absolutely and it was kind of funny I'll share a little story with you. Um, me and Derek, the night before the final day at the Worlds, I was actually tied for the lead for the World Championship. And all I had to do was go out and shoot a better match than the person I was tied with, and I'd win. So I was pretty pretty uh, excited. And Derek was in the room. He was like, I mean, he was probably a long ways back. You know, uh -huh. He wasn't even in the picture. And uh, anyway, we were joking around, and, and he said, what about me, Paul? You give me a chance? <laughs> and I made a joke with him. I said something, you know, I forget now. And by golly, Eric, Derek came back and kicked everybody's butt. That's I mean, crazy. he came from way back on that final day. He just killed it, yeah. you know? And I, of course, that's that's nothing out of the ordinary for him. I mean, he was, you know, best shooter in the world and, you know, just absolutely annihilated it. But, yeah, I mean uh, – Talk about tough competition. It's tough. Yeah, on the last day, I got I went from 19 to fifth, and that's I, good. I was like, oh, uh, you know, it, you know, it, it's it's when you have that momentum that you go. I just wish yeah. you go another day, you know. But well, I was walking over my target because um, I did pretty well in my first relay, my second match. You know, I go over there and you mm -hmm. get the scorecard and you get the target number. Right. And I was I was walking up my target number. I think it was John Pierce said. I remember, I don't remember what target was like target 15 or something. And John said, good luck. <laughs> He's cause he just was there and it was very, very slow pit service. Uh, so that's, it, that's one thing that I really like e targets cause that yeah. eliminates the, the slow pit service. Now they do yeah. need some work, right? There there's, there's, they're still in the beginning stages, but I think that's something that F class needs to focus on is developing e targets yeah. because that's to me it's the fairest way that you can shoot because sure. as you know all you need is a slow puller and you're done yep well i couldn't buy a five i mean i was four 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 it's taking forever to come back up and the wind was changing oh, and yeah. that's kind of similar to elr you know if you don't you're not shooting quick you'll just get those misses out the side it's the same thing yeah yeah but anyway well good deal paul i appreciate you being on again uh uh i keep I keep uh, just asking more and more info about ELR. Just it just it just seems uh, appealing, especially the one mile. I think that was a good move because that's the uh, that's going to be an entry point for a lot of people. It, it's it's hard to go from a thousand yards to two miles. You know what I mean? It's 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 hard. But yeah, no, I know. I I agree. Um, you know, I'd say two thousand yards and in, 
nowadays is very, very doable. I mean, everybody, even beginners and rookies can go out to 2000 yards pretty, pretty regularly, pretty, pretty good. Um, but, uh, when you get back from worlds, uh, let me know and we'll, we'll hook up and uh, bring a couple of guns and ammo and you can have some fun there you with go. it. We'll do that. All right, Paul. I appreciate it, man. Take Thank care. Thank you very much for all you do, Eric. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Good luck.